When selecting capacitors, a common question is whether you can swap out MLCCs or ceramics with polymer electrolytics. Using this off-the-shelf eval board, I found a demonstration that answers the question. In this video, I talk about the difference between the two capacitor types, why this question even comes up, the circuit I used for testing, and then I show a bunch of measurements. Welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. My name is James. Let's go measure. One trade-off with Class II ceramics is that they lose capacitance with applied voltage. In general, the higher the rated capacitance, the worse the DC bias or voltage coefficient is. For example, I measured a 22 microfarad MLCC rated for 10 volts on an LCR meter. This graph shows the results. At 50% rated voltage, it drops to 6.7 microfarads. And at the full rate of voltage, it is only a few microfarads for a loss of over 80%. And to be clear, this effect happens to all class two and three ceramic capacitors, which have coefficients like X7R, X5R, or Y5B. Chip style polymers are electrolytic capacitors made with tantalum as the anode, tantalum pentoxide as the dielectric, and a layer of P dot as the cathode. P dot is a solid conductive polymer material. These have very high capacitance and relatively low ESR. Most importantly, they do not have a DC bias effect. By the way, there are also aluminum polymer capacitors that use a similar cathode material. These come in traditional can and stack chip styles. In this video, however, I am only showing the polymer tantalum style that Kemet calls KO cap. So when I say KO cap or polymer, I mean the same thing. Of course, I also have a video that goes into polymers in more details. Check for a link below for that. Now, one question is, if ceramics have this huge DC bias effect, is it possible to replace them with KO caps? which does not have that effect. Let's go find out. For testing, I am using this evaluation board as the device under test, or DUT. Its original schematic is a little messy, so here's a simplified version of how I configured it. R9 sets the switching frequency to about 150 kilohertz. The voltage feedback network sets the output to 3.3 volts. The input capacitors, the switches, and the inductor are unchanged. Our focus is this group of capacitors. There are four 1206 footprints near the MOSFETs and four 7343 footprints near the output terminals. Half of each are on the top and bottom of the board. On the actual board, these are the 1206 footprints and these are the 7343 footprints with another set on the bottom. For equipment, I am using a low noise oscilloscope, an electronic load, and a linear power supply. I am connecting with 10 to 1 passive probes with ground clips, which are not ideal for ripple measurements, but they make the measurements easier for me. Quick side note. In the eval board's manual, it says to keep the scope probe's signal to ground loop very short, yet they don't provide a ground test point near VN or V out, so you pretty much have to use the clips. But I am after comparison measurements. I'm not trying to evaluate the performance of the converter for its data sheet. I just want to see what happens when changing capacitors without a bunch of other variables. So all things considered, it should be a fair comparison. That said, I am using an electronic load. Since these are reactive, their control loop can interfere with the DUTS control loop. So I did a very early test where I made measurements with power resistors. Then I compared the results from the load and I felt that the numbers were close enough. Also, I learned a valuable lesson in the need for cooling power resistors. So because the load measurements were close enough and that's the only reason I'm going to use the load in this video, which again, I think will work for comparisons. Since I had planned to use specific resistor values, I did keep all of my tests at 330 milliamps, 3.3, and 15 amps. In each test case, I let the oscilloscope gather at least 500 measurements, and then I recorded the mean values of the RMS and peak-to-peak -peak voltages of both VN and Vout. Also, I recorded Vout spectrum, but it really does not change throughout all of the measurements that I made. With all of that, let's go make some measurements. The first test case is the suggested configuration that shipped on the eval board for 100 microfarad ceramics. I ran through the measurements I described before and collected the results. The ripple range from 130 up to 151 millivolts. So our baseline at 15 amps is right around 150 millivolts. Next, all four ceramics were replaced with 1206 equivalent sized KO caps. Each of these are rated for the same voltage and 100 microfarads. 
The A in the part number is a case size roughly the same as a 1206. Same as before, I ran through all of the measurements, and the results are a few percent higher than the baseline, which might suggest there is no reason to replace MLCCs with KO caps or polymers. However, there is a key difference between the boards in those tests that I forgot to mention. The MLCC board has two polymers on the backside near the connection post. The A-case polymer test case did not. So I had to play that trick because that is the critical comparison. The MLCC board had ceramics rated for 400 microfarads and about 1000 microfarads of polymers, while the KO cap board only had about 400 microfarads of polymers, but with similar ripple to the ceramic test case. Now, something that's really easy to overlook is that high capacitance ceramics can cost just as much as a polymer capacitor. The single piece price for the capacitors I used in this evaluation are shown here. Using those, I created a solution cost comparison. While the polymer only solution did have 4.6% more ripple, it cost almost 60% less than the ceramic plus polymers. Now keep in mind, I was limited to the specific case size, capacitance, and voltage to make this a one-to-one -one comparison. But even with those limits, I was still able to find an alternative. Now you might be wondering, what if the ceramic solution did not have those bulk polymers on it? So I removed them. And then I ran the test again at 3.3 amps, and yeah, its ripple is on the order of volts, not millivolts. Either there isn't enough effective capacitance from the four MLCCs because of the DC bias effect, or there is not enough ESR on the output for the control loop causing it to become unstable. Either way, the four ceramics by themselves is not a viable solution. And for one more comparison, I put the two 470 microfarad capacitors onto the four polymer solution. That change dropped its ripple by 45%. It did, however, increase its cost by about 5% more than the others. So in this case, we could have saved money and saved board space by switching to polymers instead of using high capacitance MLCCs. Next, let's cover a few more measurements. Remember I said ceramic capacitors have a DC bias effect or voltage coefficient. This graph is from Kimmet's KSIM. The yellow line is the MLCC with no DC voltage applied, and the blue line has the 3.3 volts of our supply's output. The 100 microfarad capacitor dropped to 46 <clears throat> microfarads, or about half. So I thought, let's see what happens with two 100 microfarad polymers. I ran the test twice, with and without the bulk 470 microfarad capacitors on the output terminals. By themselves, the ripple is worse, but with the large bulk KO caps, the ripple drops quite a bit, and it is still cheaper than the original 4MLCC with polymer solution. So that's another positive test case for replacing MLCCs with polymers. Now, with all of that said, I do need to mention one thing. Frequency matters. These measurements were all done with the converter operating at 157 kilohertz. However, the board shipped set to 390 kilohertz. If we look at the capacitance versus frequency simulation for the 100 microfarad KO cap, 390 kilohertz is pretty close to its self resonance point, which means it is acting less like a capacitor. And to be fair, at that frequency, four MLCCs versus four polymers had a slightly different outcome. In conclusion, can you replace MLCCs with KO caps or polymer electrolytic capacitors? Well, I say yes, sometimes you can, but you should consider a few things. Always consider that multi-layer ceramic capacitors have a DC bias effect. You need to see what their effective capacitance will be in your application. Polymer footprints are more readily available in case sizes larger than MLCCs. So if you know you want to experiment, consider larger or multi-pad solutions for easier swaps. Also for polymers, watch the switching frequency and their response. In general, they respond to higher frequencies as their rated ESR goes down. More also, those larger polymer footprints can have really low ESRs, like single digit, when compared to the 1206 equivalent size footprints. I made those last points because if you end up using a larger case size polymer, you can get lower ESR, better frequency response, and you may end up using up less board space overall. By the way, I collected a ton of data, and you can find that over on the Element 14 community using the link below. Hey, thanks for watching. Check the link below for show notes on the Element 14 community. You'll find lots of great stuff over there. If you want to see more videos from me or the other host, tap or click the things on the screen. For now, it is time for me to get back to my electronics workbench.